Chapter 54 Luli The compass led them to a rocky incline, a two-hour hike from Gibbon. Luli climbed up steep pathways littered with gravel and red dust, meandering along crooked trails and inched past drops running with wa rushing water. It was not the most perilous journey she'd ever made, but it was easily the most difficult on account of the pain that shot through her injured ankles with every step. By the time they were near the top, her legs trembled and sweat coated her forehead and neck. Truly, she should not have been taken this journey, but she had to, to prove to herself she was capable, that she did not need to rely on Kadir. And yet, here they were, both of them. Kadir had refused to let her go alone and was trailing her from a distance, watching silently as, he sh as she struggled. He did not try to help her, and because it was clear she was in no mood for conversation, he did not speak to her. Even yesterday in the sukh, he had been quiet, content to accompany her just to make sure neither she nor the prince did anything stupid, as he put it. Luli was so trapped in her thoughts, she did not notice the dip in the cliff ledge. She stepped too hard and would have slipped off the edge had Kadir not grabbed her from behind. She realized, only belatedly, that she had reached for him at the same moment. The two of them stood there, trembling, staring at each other. And then Luli pulled away, curled her fingers into a fist, and kept walking. She was still shaken when they reached the top of the cliff, a plateau so high she could see the entirety of Gibbon, the winding streams, the patches of green, and the vibrant sook in the center, filled with crowds of people and charming displays. She glanced at the water crashing down the cliff, then looked at its source, a large lake, only steps away. The water is infinite, Kadir said, when he saw the confusion on her face, created by gin blood, no doubt, like that damned forever refilling hourglass. Once she thought it worthless. Now that she knew the true nature of relics, she realized it was anything but. She pulled her out the compass, the last magic she had left besides Kadir's knife, and squinted at the arrow. It was pointing at the lake. Of course, the relic was underwater. Ideas? Kadir stood behind her, glaring at the lake. He never liked water. Luli sighed as she began pulling off layers. When she was down to her most basic garments, she slid out of her shoes, set down the compass and knife, and edged toward the water. Be careful, Kadir called. Wet sand gathered between her toes as she stepped into the lake. She saw rocks, moss, and then there, a glimmer of silver. From this distance, she could not tell what it was, only that it was buried beneath silt. She stepped forward, once, twice, and then the sand shifted beneath her feet and she slid. By the time she caught herself, the water had risen to her chest. She cursed beneath her breath. Luli, Kadir called from the bank. I'm fine, she mumbled and continued walking. Soon the water was up to her chin, but the relic was close. She could see now that it was a ring. She paused to count down in her head. Salata, Itnan, Wahid, and Dove. She plunged into the darkness that grabbed at her with cold, invisible hands. She shoved down her fear as she swam deeper, clawing through the sand in her blind search for the ring. Pressure built in her ears. It had a sound, a moan, that penetrated deep in her bones. Come on, come on. She felt something cold and hard beneath her fingers and grasped at it desperately. Relief flooded her body as she caught hold of it. And then the thing moved. It wasn't a ring. It was too large, too slippery, too sharp. She jerked away, but too late. The thing grabbed her wrist and pulled her down. Her eyes shut open. She stared into the darkness, and the darkness stared back. Milky white eyes with dilated pupils blinked at her from the gloom and beneath those eyes a crescent-shaped mouth filled with rows of sharp teeth. No. She dug her nails into the scaled flesh. It only tightened its grip. No. The sharpened teeth parted beneath her feet, and the glazed white eyes blinked, inches from her own. Luli scraped at them, desperate, and the beast roared, making the entire lake shudder. Cracks of silver spread through the darkness. Fins, she realized. Large, razor-sharp fins, shimmering with dull scales, and one of those oddly shaped fins was just beginning to loosen around her wrist. Luli clenched her teeth and kicked. The silver-tipped darkness thrashed against her, but she was persistent. Another kick, and she managed to pull free. Her lungs were starved of air, and her ankles were on fire. 
but she pushed herself up toward the surface, or at least she tried to, but her body was suddenly heavy, and the water was pulling her down, down, down. When the thing grabbed her again, she was too weak to fight back. But no, wait, it was pulling her up? She crashed through the surface of the water with a gasp, even as someone, Kadir, pulled her to shore. He set her down at the water's edge and ordered her to breathe until the pressure in her lungs eased and she stopped coughing up water. When he spoke, his voice was jagged at the edges. Luli, he sat shuddering beside her, rivulets of water trickling down his muscled back and chest. Though he'd avoided soaking his shirt, she had the impression he had drenched more than just his skin, for his eyes were pale, feeble yellow, the color of a dying flame. So you do know how to swim. Her words were barely a rasp, and for some reason, that made her laugh. It made her laugh so hard she started crying. Kadir pulled her to him. I'm sorry, he said softly. I did not realize there was anything in the water. What was all she managed between her hiccups? A dendon, Kadir said. You remember the stories old Ruba used to tell? Luli did remember. Old Ruba had always described the dendon as a monster fish, a creature big enough to eat ships whole. But in his stories, the creature died after devouring human flesh or hearing a human voice. This monster did not seem so feeble to her. Jin blood changes living things, Kadir said, as if scenting, as if sensing her thoughts. He cast a forlorn look over his shoulder at the still water. Like ghouls, all kinds of creatures are drawn to our magic. This is what happens when such a monster has been drenched in gin blood. Luli thought of the massacre between the Merid and the humans. How the mythical Dendon had found its way here into fresh water, she did not know. But if it was sensitive to the lamentations of the dead, then she could see why it had developed a taste for human flesh. It was no wonder this relic had been here for so long. The relic! She pushed herself away from Kadir and glanced at the water, heart sinking. She had failed. She had failed this one simple thing. Looking for this? Kadir held out a glimmering object. The ring inlaid with cerulean blue jewel. Luli grabbed it from him, eyes wide. How did you get this? She slid the ring onto her finger. Nothing happened. The Dendin had eyes only for you. He leaned over her shoulder to tap the gem at the center. It allows you to breathe underwater. I slid it onto my finger when I was under the surface. The magic did not last long, maybe seven or eight heartbeats at most. It was like the hourglass, a humble magic, and yet she was relieved. It will sell then. You know magic always sells. She nodded quietly. Now that the danger had passed, she realized with clear greater clarity where she was, who she was with. She had come here to prove to herself she was not useless, and yet again she had needed Kadir's help. Her shoulders slumped as she looked away. Thank you for saving me. You look disappointed. Not disappointed, just ashamed. Luli, he said close, he slid closer until their shoulders were touching. Talk to me. Luli pulled her knees to her chest and stared resolutely at the water. There's nothing to say. The words caught in her throat as she said them. The truth was that she missed talking to Kadir. She missed him. Fine, then I will speak and you can listen. Out of the corner of her eye, Luli saw him drape an arm over his knee. He was dry. Not a single bead of water left on him. But that was hardly surprising given he could combust into flames. Do you remember what I told you in Dime? That the compass led me to relics so I could find a place for them to exist after death? His sigh was heavy enough to make his eyes cloud over with smoke. It was the truth. I could not seek redemption in my country after what I had done, so I sought it here in the human world. My greatest fear was that Kalila would lead me to my fellow Ifrit. He smiled, a self-deprecating twitch of his lips that was barely discernible. I told you before, I was a coward, and that is also true. It is the reason I did not tell you I was an Ifrit, the reason I have not sought out my old companions. His, his smile slipped, the reason I sank a country. There was silence, and then, a few breaths later, Kadir spoke again. I thought I might be able to run forever, but then that full of a human sultan asked you to track down an Ifrit's relic, and I realized I had to make a choice. I could run, or I could face my past. Luli felt his gaze shift to her. 
I had planned to tell you the truth when we found the lamp, but then you recovered the resurrectionist's relic and witnessed her magic. I saw your rage and fear, and I withheld the truth, thinking you would shun me if I told you I had that same power. Luli stifled a nervous laugh. He had to be pulling her leg. How could he not see that she depended on him, that she always had? Why stay with me at all, she said. You don't need some weak human girl to help you face your past. The words escaped before she could stop them. Panic echoed through the hollow chambers of her heart, building until she could barely breathe. Kadir stared at her, wide-eyed. When she tried to slide away, he grabbed her by the shoulder and turned her around. Weak? His eyes shimmered with a fierce blue light. Is that what all this is about? Why you've been sulking? Luli was rendered speechless by the intensity of his gaze. She'd been expecting exasperation, not this anger shining in his eyes. It's the truth, isn't it? She hated how bitter the words were, how small and self-pitying. But the moment she said them, a dam broke inside of her, and the rest of the confession came out as a torrent of words. I couldn't do anything, not when my tribe was killed, and not now. I can never do anything without your help. If I hadn't had your knife in the ruins, she blinked back tears, if you hadn't been there. It is not a weakness to rely on others for help, Kadir said. Luli did not know when, but at some point she had reached for his hand. Now she was holding on to it as if it were some lifeline. Weak, said the voice in her mind. Weak, weak, weak. Luli, gently, so gently it made her tremble, Kadir set a hand on her cheek and turned her face so that she was looking at him. You rely on me, but I also rely on you. We are a team, you and I. But I don't. You are the most courageous person I know, Luli al-Nazari. Without you, I would still be aimlessly wandering the desert, lost in my grief. You are not weak. That is why I follow where you walk, because I trust you. His expression softened. What happened to your family? I truly am sorry, Luli. She did not realize she had started crying again until Kadir ran a thumb under her cheek, wiping away a stray tear. I would never have followed your family's trail if I'd known someone was tracking me. I was only walking where the compass bade me to go. I was... lost. Luli rubbed her eyes. Yes, I know. She forced herself to look him in the eyes, to hold his gaze. It's not your fault. Something inside of her released with the words, leaving her feeling not empty, but deflated. Not weak, but vulnerable. She could have turned away then, could have heeded the words in her mind that said, You should let him go. But she realized she did not want to. She wanted to stay with Kadir, and Kadir, he could have left many times, but he was still here. You're not going to disappear on me again, are you? Kadir never broke his gaze. No. Even if the compass leads you somewhere else? I told you before, didn't I? We are connected. The compass led me to you, and is and it is with you I shall stay until destiny depend, demands we part ways. You make it sound like it is not your choice to stay or go. Some things are out of our control. You know that just as well as I. All we can do is make choices based on the cards fate deals us. But so long as fate allows me to stay with you, I will not leave you, Luli. That is a promise. It was the most Kadir-like answer, and it made her laugh despite herself. It was more a choking sound than a chuckle, but it was enough to make her smile. I will kick your ass if you lie to me again, Kadir. Kadir shrugged. Fair enough. He stood and held out his hand. In response, Luli grabbed Hip's tunic up off the ground and threw it at him. Put your shirt on. You're indecent. She gathered her own layers as she glanced down at the city, which, after everything that had happened, suddenly seemed more energetic, more inviting. Luli, something for your troubles. Kadir was holding something out to her. Her heart lifted at the sight of the two-faced coin. I didn't realize you had more than one, she said as she took it from him. Kadir pulled his tunic over his head with a shrug. You never asked, but this is the last one, so do not lose it. Luli looked at the gold. Is Kadir telling the truth about wanting to stay with me? She flipped the coin. It came down on the human side. She stifled a sigh of relief. Fine, let's go. We've wasted enough time. Kadir raised a brow. Time to make some gold? Luli grinned through her tears. Yes, let's go sell a relic.